We could have a base on the moon within 30 years, reach Mars in 50 years, and explore the moons of the outer planets in 200 years. By reach, I mean with manned, or should I say, person space flight. We have already driven rovers on Mars, and landed a probe on Titan, a moon of Saturn, but if one is considering the future of the human race, we have to go there ourselves. Going into space won't be cheap, but it would take only a small proportion of world resources. NASA's budget has remained roughly constant in real terms since the time of the Apollo landings, but it has decreased from 0.3% of US GDP in 1970 to 0.12% now. Even if we were to increase the international budget 20 times to make a serious effort to go into space, it would only be a small fraction of world GDP. There will be those who argue that it would be better to spend our money solving the problems of this planet, like climate change and pollution, rather than wasting it on a possibly fruitless search for a new planet. I am not denying the importance of fighting climate change and global warming, but we can do that, and still spare a quarter of a percent of world GDP for space. Isn't our future worth a quarter of a percent? We thought space was worth a big effort in the 60s. In 1962, President Kennedy permitted the U.S. to land a man on the moon by the end of the decade. This was achieved just in time by the Apollo 11 mission in 1969. The space race helped to create a fascination with science and led to great advances in technology including the first large-scale integrated circuits, which are the basis of all modern computers. However, after the last moon landing in 1972, with no future plans for further manned space flight, public interest in space declined. This went along with a general disenchantment with science in the West, because although it had brought great benefits, it had not solved the social problems that increasingly occupied public attentions. A new manned space flight program would do a lot to restore public enthusiasm for space and for science generally. Robotic missions are much cheaper and may provide more scientific information, but they don't catch the public imagination in the same way, and they don't spread the human race into space which I'm arguing should be our long-term strategy. A goal of a base on the moon by 2020, and of a manned landing on Mars by 2025, would reignite the space program, and give it a sense of purpose, in the same way that President Kennedy's moon target did in the 1960s. A new interest in space, would also increase the public standing of science generally. The low esteem in which science and scientists are held is having serious consequences. We live in a society that is increasingly governed by science and technology, yet fewer and fewer young people want to go into science. As a small step towards curing this, my daughter, Lucy and I, have written a children's book. I will now let Lucy talk about how to encourage the next generation to take an interest in space, and in science generally. Hello and good afternoon. I'm very, very honoured to be here at the NASA 50th birthday lecture series. It's a great honour to be here talking to you. You've heard my father telling you about why we need to travel into space. Well, I'd like to take just a few minutes to tell you why we think we need to have a next generation who wants to travel into space as well. As my father said, at the moment, we face a paradox. Never before have science and technology played such a big part in our lives. And yet, at the same time, it seems that children are turning away from science. They're losing interest in science, and they're not studying it. 
So I'd like to talk a bit about what we learn from children, what we learned about children in science education, and how NASA makes a great contribution to ensuring that the next generation does engage with science. Last year, my dad and I published a book for kids. It's an adventure story in which all the adventures are based on real science. It's about a little boy who lives next door to a scientist. And this scientist has an amazing computer called Cosmos. And Cosmos is so powerful and so intelligent, he can draw a doorway through which you can walk to any part of the known universe that you want to visit. Now, when I told some people at NASA about Cosmos, the fictional computer, they said, oh, I wish we had one of them because that would help our budget enormously. <laughs> now, my father wanted to work on this project because of his high level of concern about children and science education. Now, that's not saying that we set out to persuade every child to be a scientist, because our world needs people with a wide variety of skills. But science affects all of us, and it matters to all of us, and it will do even more so in the future. The children of today are the adults of tomorrow, and they need to have a basic understanding of science if they're going to make the kind of decisions that will affect us all. And we're going to need scientists as well, not just to work on space travel, but to work on issues that face us all, like climate change, or fuel sources, or food production. Now, some recent research has highlighted the fears about children and science education. In the United Kingdom, a recent survey found that a third of UK school children believe that wartime Prime Minister Winston Churchill was the first man to walk on the moon. I'm sorry about that. NASA, Neil Armstrong. And though the, the statistics that came with this survey are not very heartening either. They found that 40% of children thought Mars was a chocolate bar. 35% of children said the Earth was not an official planet. And extraordinarily, 72% could not identify the moon from pictures. Now, just in case you're sitting there feeling smug, I'm afraid the results in the USA are really not looking much better. <laughs> Only 4% of US adults, when asked, could name a living scientist who they would nominate as a science role model. Although, at the same time, 96%, a stunning 96% of US adults think that it is important for the US to be a leader in science education. So it all sounds rather gloomy, but, there is hope, as I found out when I went on a worldwide schools lecture tour with a talk called Surfing the Solar System. It's about the sort of concepts of astronomy and theoretical physics that we set out to cover in our book. Now, I've probably spoken, we estimate, I've probably spoken to about 20,000 kids worldwide. And what I discovered was an enormous appetite and enthusiasm for science. And we were asked so many questions that we have to write another book in order to be able to answer them. And they're great questions like, can you skateboard on Jupiter? <laughs> and what my personal favorite is, what does happen if you get to the edge of the universe? <laughs> now, you could say that we're just lucky, that we've got the rock star end of science at our disposal. And without a doubt, I can tell you that black holes presented by Stephen Hawking, explained simply for kids, is a winner. We had them. We had them with us all the way. But more seriously, some research at universities in the UK shows that a significant percentage of students studying sciences, and I mean across the board, this isn't just physics, report that their interest in science was sparked by exactly these topics. They went on to become scientists because of an early interest in astronomy and the exotic phenomena of theoretical physics. That space has the power to capture children's imagination and engage their curiosity, there seems absolutely no doubt. And we have never needed to do this more urgently.